Good evening and welcome to the podcast brought to you by Heartland Lifestyle Center and the Emerson Clinic. We're so excited that you've joined us this evening and we have a husband and wife team tonight, Dr. and Mrs. Emerson. You can call me Olita. I'm a registered nurse and of course he's a physician and our topic this evening is sleep. Dr. Emerson, <clears throat> oh, before I begin, I need to just provide you with a disclaimer. The information provided in this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or give medical advice. Any personal choices made based on the information provided in this presentation are the sole responsibility of the individual. The speaker cannot be held liable for any actions or consequences resulting from the use of this information. So Dr. Emerson, why the focus on sleep? Well, it's uh, ubiquitous in America. It's, it's so prevalent um, and it has consequences. Uh, actually, we're getting uh, less sleep than our ancestors got uh, years ago. Um, and because of this, we're experiencing the consequences. Some of us aren't aware of some of the consequences that come from sleep deprivation. And many of us have chronic sleep deprivation and we're experiencing decrease in productivity and we're blissfully unaware of it. Uh, and that's the tragedy. We may be functioning at 50% our capability and wonder why we can't produce more, why we can't function better. We may think we're just born that way when in fact it may be chronic sleep deprivation and if we would just get seven to eight hours of sleep a night, our productivity could improve dramatically. So Dr. Emerson, can you describe some of these consequences or what I would say, what a sleep deprived person looks like? Well, actually uh, much of the information I'm gonna share came from a video put up years ago called uh, Fatigue Busters, excellent video. Um, some of the uh, uh, the uh, symptoms are chronic fatigue. Um, mothers and working women are at highest risk for this chronic fatigue. Um, it can cause irritability, uh, motor vehicle accidents and flying accidents can occur with uh, lack of sleep. Uh, I remember the uh, one motor vehicle accident I've had in my life was after a night on call. I had lack of sleep and uh, I was just wasn't able to pay attention the way I should have been and had a motor vehicle accident. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the problems. The other thing is hurt relationships. Our closest relationships are in our families. With lack of sleep, we can be irritable and it can break down those relationships. Um, and lastly, uh, decreased productivity. We aren't able to function as well. I remember, if, I'd had a night on call where I didn't get much sleep. Next day I had to see patients in the office. I would drag from one patient to the next. It was a real problem. Whereas when I'm rested, I could bounce from one to the next and put a lot of energy and effort into it. And it was uh, changed the whole experience. Now I understand so. that's not the only accident you've been in due to sleep deprivation. Uh, was there another mm -hmm. accident you were in? Well, that was when you were driving. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> You want to describe what happened? Yes. Yeah. So I, we were actually driving to this very location, and I was determined to let uh, my husband, Dr. Emerson, have some sleep, and I pushed it. I knew I was very tired. I'd only had one hour of sleep the night before, and I pushed until I actually fell asleep while driving and rear-ended a semi. The semi came to a stop at a stoplight, but I did not come to a stop went right into the rear of the semi, and it totally pushed the front of our um, Toyota up, cracked the windshield, totally destroyed our car. The real miracle was that we lived through it and we weren't hospitalized. Um, and I've never forgotten that um, occasion where our lives were spared, but not everyone is so fortunate if they drive drowsy and have an accident. As a matter of fact, some statistics on accidents on sleep deprivation, the CDC uh, calls drowsy driving when you've had, when you've been awake 
18 hours, and it gets worse every hour after 18 hours. It's equivalent to a blood alcohol level of 0.05 to 0.08% and contributes to 8.8% to 9.5% of all crashes. And most driving accidents that can happen in the day or night. A lot of times we think drowsy driving only happens at night, but it actually happens during the daytime as well, especially at dawn and dusk. And 25.8% um, happen after dark. Um, here's an interesting st statistic based on women have 54.1% of those drowsy driving accidents and men 45.9% of the driving drowsy driving accidents. So these are some just some interesting statistics. Um, does age have to do with any of the drowsy driving? Um, 20 to 24 year olds have the most drowsy driving accidents, followed by 16 to 19 year olds, whereas 35 to 49 year olds have the fewest drowsy driving accidents. So Dr. Emerson, what are some of the causes of fatigue? Well, that's not, not no mystery. Uh, long hours of mental stress, long hours of physical activity uh, can contribute to this. We actually have a biological rhythm, and during the day, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our body temperature actually increases. And during the night, of course, they decrease. Your metabolism slows down. And our mental alertness follows the same pattern. During the day, we're more mentally alert, and at night, of course, we're less alert. Um, if we follow a regular schedule uh, of getting up and going to bed at the same time, having meals at the same time, our body actually adapts to that. Sometimes people have trouble falling asleep at night and say, I'm not sleepy. Whereas if they had a regular bedtime, they would actually, the body would actually adapt and start getting you sleepy at that regular bedtime. And uh, before meals, we could actually get hungry if we had our meals at the same time. The body would start getting hungry at the appropriate times. When we don't have a regular schedule, we miss out on that, that beneficial effect. Um, so, so fatigue does affect our ability to function. Um, they did some interesting uh, experiments at Walter Reed Institute um, years ago. They found that flying airplanes and driving cars, the performance decreases as fatigue sets in. And as you pointed out, it has an effect very similar to alcohol. In fact, if there is motor vehicle accident, emergency room, the two questions we'd ask, was it alcohol related or sleep related? Mm. They both affect the brain in a very similar, similar manner. Um, we have tests for alcohol, for drivers with alcohol. Uh, we don't test for sleep deprivation, though. Maybe we should. <laughs> Fascinating enough, though, if you have a car accident where sleep deprivation played a role, you will be ticketed um, because they will consider that irresponsible driving, and a person will obtain a ticket for it. Yeah. Um, interesting thing about sleep also is that the higher functions go first. Mm. By the higher functions, I'm talking about judgment, initiative, creativity, forethought, reasoning. Um, and the lower functions go last. Those functions keep you breathing, keep your blood pressure up, keep your heart rate up, your body temperature up. These are essential functions. So when you lack sleep, your brain can't do all of those things. Mm. And so it says, okay, I've, I've got to cut out some of the uh, functions of the brain. Should I cut out the lower functions or the higher functions? Well, if it cuts out the lower functions, you die. Yeah. So it cuts out the higher functions, which are judgment, initiative, creativity, forethought, and reason. Um, and it's these higher functions that enable us to make good decisions. Uh, that's where our ability to solve math problems comes in, where we have moral decisions. Is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Um, those are the functions that are carried out in the frontal lobe and uh, 
are decreased when, when we lack sleep. Now I remember you sharing that there's like a little, I don't know if it's a cartoon or uh, just a story or an example of how when the doctors or the residents come to the hospital after working so many hours and the nurses' impressions of them. Yes. Um, Something about the, the doctor will come yeah. in and they think they have the best nurses. And yeah, then there was a, uh, yeah, I've, I was going to share that. <laughs> uh, yeah, when a uh, physician had a, uh, when he was on call, residency, he uh, uh, would be on call. It would start Friday evening, and it would go Saturday, Sunday, and then he'd have to work Monday, three days. And said, you know, the first day on call, well, what he noticed was that his lack of sleep affected the nurse's performance. <laughs> and so he'd come to work. Friday, nurses were good. They were, had their normal ability. But on Saturday, the nurses were not functioning as well. They, were a little bit, they weren't carrying out orders. Uh, the third day, the nurses were impossible. They couldn't understand the orders. They weren't carrying them out. They were irritable. Um, and then after he got a good night's sleep, the next day, the nurses were functioning back to normal again. And so, uh, yeah, his perception of their effect was... Uh, was, was really his, his lack of sleep and probably his yeah, it was inability to communicate effectively That's with right. the lack of sleep. You, you mentioned that the sleep deprivation strongly affects relationships. And yeah. I know our home has experienced that when we had our children. Um, I would be up during the night breastfeeding our children and then of course up all day because children are awake all day. Um, and how did that affect our home? Um, my experience was when you weren't getting the sleep, uh, it affected my performance because I couldn't do anything right. <laughs> wow, that must have been hard. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember you called the counselor and what did she ask you? Well, the questions were, uh, how much sleep are you getting? Or is there a new baby in the home, is what her question was. And of course, that answer was yes. And so they told me to get the adequate rest. And then if I still was having issues, call them back. Yeah, and that, that helped dramatically when you got the sleep. Uh, relationships improved. Um, and relationships are based on our higher functions. We got to have our frontal lobe intact. Um, there's an interesting question I, I had. I, I remember people telling me, yeah, your, your moral decisions, your calculating decisions are made in your frontal lobe. I said, well, how do they know that? I mean, when you move a muscle, you know what muscle's active, you can see it mm -hmm. act. But the brain, you can't see which part of the brain is doing the work at any given moment. Uh, well, the first indication they had that your moral decisions and your higher functions were in the frontal lobe was with a story in uh, Dr. Nedley's book, Proof Positive. He relates about a story about Phineas Gage, where they were uh, building roads, and they would drill into rocks. They would put into dynamite. They would then put in a fuse. Then they would put in the packing, and then they would tamp it down with a spike, with a long metal rod. Well, for some reason, they put in the dynamite in this hole, they put in the fuse, but they forgot to put the packing in. Mm. And when they put the metal in, it sparked it, it exploded and shot the metal rod through his eye and out his forehead. The amazing thing was, is that he lived through it. Um, but he was a different person. He had lost his frontal lobe. And uh, prior to that, he'd been a foreman, responsible. He was a family man, taking care of his family, he'd go to church. Uh, once his frontal lobe was gone, he stopped going to church. He could no longer be foreman, was no longer responsible. He ended up leaving his family, joined a circus. Um, but the brain is very plastic, and I heard uh, secondhand the rest of the story was that eventually another part of his brain started taking over the function of the frontal lobe, mm -hmm. and he actually started becoming more responsible again. Um, 
But that was one indication of where, or one clue of how important the frontal lobe is. Uh, the other comes from PET scans. Um, our brain can metabolize sugar very well, has trouble metabolizing protein and fat. So when they do a PET scan, they tag sugar, mm -hmm. and the sugar goes into the brain. And then when they do a scan, they look for this tagged sugar. And wherever the sugar is accumulating, that's where the brain is working. Mm -hmm. So they'll put a person in a dark room, shine a picture on the wall, and the back of the brain lights up, the occipital load lights up, because that's where you process vision. And they shut the picture off, and they play, or they, they play, they talk to them, they speak words, and one of the temporal lobes lights up, that's where you process words. Then they shut the words off, and they play music, and the other temporal lobe lights up, because that's where you process music. And this is why when two people are talking to you, you can only follow one train of conversation. You can't follow two if they're talking at the same time, because you overload the temporal lobe. But if someone's singing to you, you can appreciate the words and the music because they're processed in different parts of the brain and they're not overloaded. We were designed that way. Uh, God actually designed us to appreciate music uh, when the world was created. The Bible says the angels sang for joy. Angels apparently are built the same way. They can appreciate music um, in a similar fashion. So they shut the music off and now they project a math problem on a screen and they say, okay, work out the math problem. Of course, the occipital lobe lights up because your vision is involved, but now your frontal lobe kicks in because you're making decisions. You're figuring out what the math problem solution is, and that's where the frontal lobe comes in. Um, if you have lack of sleep, these functions decrease, and the one affected most uh, seriously is the frontal lobe. It's affected more than any of the other lobes when you lack sleep, uh, according to the PET scans. Um, also, certain drugs will decrease the brain's ability to process information. Um, cocaine, for instance. Cocaine is a vasoconstrictor. And I usually like to show pictures of a PET scan without cocaine. It shows the whole brain lit up on on a PET scan indicating the whole brain is functioning. With cocaine, all those areas decrease dramatically, wow. especially uh, the frontal lobe. In fact, the vasoconstriction with cocaine can be so serious, uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, we had a lady come to the emergency room. She couldn't talk. And she was a young girl, you know, in her 20s. And I thought, <laughs> Why can't she talk? Does she have a stroke? Well, the cat scan showed, yeah, she had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And we wondered, why does a young girl like this have a stroke? Well, we did a urine talk screen, it showed cocaine, metabolites. Mm -hmm. And the cocaine had caused such severe vasoconstriction that it shut off blood supply to part of her brain. She mm -hmm. couldn't talk. Um, it took about a year before she could slowly start talking in slow sentences. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, but that's... And while sleep deprivation might not cause a stroke, it could cause major injury if you fall asleep at the wheel. That's right. You could be life-threatening. You could lose an eye. Matter of fact, I went to school with some uh, young people, and they were driving, supposedly changing out drivers, and one of them fell asleep at the wheel, and he actually did lose an eye in the car accident. Oh. So never drive uh, drowsy. And drowsy does, um, it's, if you even nod off one time, that means you're too tired to drive. And it's best to pull over and take a 20 minute nap uh, on, the, on the side of the road. Um, be sure your car is far enough off the road so you don't get rear-ended by another vehicle. But it's always better to be safe than sorrier. Yeah. Now, in terms of making decisions, we need, of course, a frontal lobe to make good decisions. If we're fatigued, we can actually make good decisions, but it takes much longer to make those decisions. Oh, and are you saying there's a delayed reaction? Yeah, 
and the problem comes, of course, if there isn't enough time to make a good decision, uh -huh. you make a wrong decision with bad consequences. Um, it, they actually did studies with um, EEGs and looking at our, the frequency of the waves in our brain. We have waves and high frequency waves are, are being produced in our brain all the time. Um, these waves are kind of like the clock in a computer. Uh, a computer has a clock and the clock steps the computer through each part of its calculation so it keeps everything in order and synchronized. Um, the computer can work faster if the clock is faster. You want to buy a computer with many megahertz instead of a few megahertz clock because it'll get work done faster. Well, your brain works the same way. If you are alert, you'll have what they call uh, beta waves, which are high-frequency waves. It's where you're processing information very quickly. Information's coming in and you're analyzing it to determine, hey, is this legitimate information? How does this apply to my life? You're processing it. When you are relaxed, maybe a little bit drowsy or so, you're enjoying life, you're not critically thinking, you go into alpha waves. And that's a slower clock. It's a slower frequency. Um, if you are getting drowsy, um, you get an even slower wave. Once you go to sleep, you have a very slow wave with just short intervals of sleep spindles, they call them. Few instances of high frequency uh, <laughs> periods. And then if you're in a deep sleep, it's very slow rhythm. And that's where your brain is getting rested for the next day. Uh, <coughs> they have found uh, that this, you can move from a high frequency to a lower frequency just by uh, overloading the brain. Uh, for instance, uh, in watching TV, if your, your frontal lobe is orienting you to space and time on the TV screen, but when they change the frame of reference every three seconds, your brain doesn't know how you got from one scene to the next. It gets overloaded and it goes from beta waves, where it's analyzing things quickly and efficiently, to alpha waves, where it's more slow uh, and, and not analyzing things critically. Um, that switch from beta active to relaxed um, alpha happens within minutes. When you're in that state, if an ad comes on, which when I grew up, it was ultra bright. They said, ultra bright gives your mouth sex appeal. And I thought, and if you're, if you're in alpha waves, you think, oh, really? But if you are in beta waves, you think, I don't think so. That's a pretty you know, strong claim to make for a toothpaste. Um, and so, of course, advertisers would prefer you to be in the alpha rhythm. And that's apparently how TV shows are designed. Other things that will put you from beta into alpha, uh, polyrhythmic music. Uh, they will have music with uh, a rhythm and a normal rhythm. Your brain can uh, understand and follow, but uh, a, uh, and, and your whole brain is made so it can march to music, so it can dance to music. Um, however, with polyrhythmic music, you have one rhythm placed on top of another, on top of another, and your brain can't follow that, and the frontal lobe gets overloaded, shuts down again. Uh, devil worship in Africa, uh, Christian Berdahl shares that uh, they use polyrhythmic music to try to shut down the frontal lobes to go from beta to alpha waves, where you're more suggestible. And uh, also what happens is the, um, they'll use drugs 
with the devil worship and sex. Those three things will change you from beta to alpha. And then you're more suggestible to how hypnosis works. And also demonic spirits can now have better access to you and control you better. If you go to, uh, say, rock music or rock concert, he found that they found that when they overlaid the rhythms of the rock concerts to devil worship in Africa, the polyrhythmic music overlaid fairly closely. Uh, and that's why they generally need police at these rock concerts because there will be a riot. Because when the frontal lobe shuts down, if somebody offends somebody else, they don't reason through it, they react. Somebody punches somebody else out and they have a riot. Um, and so these are things that can shut down the frontal lobe and lack of sleep will also shut down the frontal lobe. And that's one of the, one of the uh, challenges um, with sleep deprivation. They actually did a study with an airplane pilot um, and looking at his brain waves when he was well rested, they found that his brainwave activity while he was walking to the plane was down here. When he was taxiing, it rose, was up here. When he took off, there was a blip in it where he needed more brainwave activity and there was a little blip in the activity level. Then he had a life threatening emergency and he had a large blip, a large increase in brainwave activity. He solved the emergency. This was a simulation. And then in landing, he had a small blip and then taxied the plane and then walking back to the uh, control tower, uh, brainwave activity was back down to resting state. Then they did the same pilot and they measured his brainwave activity after many hours of fatigue and it was much lower than it was previously. It was down below his previous level. Uh, Walking to the plane, taxiing was below what it was taxiing before. Had a minor emergency, had a small blip, which was normal. Then he had a life-threatening emergency. And instead of the big blip he had before, he got a little blip. Hmm. And they said if the co-pilot hadn't taken over control of the plane in that simulation, he, they would have crashed the plane. Uh, and so uh, fatigue can really hurt how we're able to perform. I know. Uh, we had, it was a night on call and we had an admission. Uh, if, if I was really exhausted, I was just hoping that it was something simple because if it was something complicated, it would take a very long time to work through it in a sleep deprived state. So, um, uh, there, us, uh, there are some uh, other examples of decreased performance. Um, there was uh, the military. Of course, the military is always interested in increasing performance, getting the most mm -hmm. out of their men. So there was an artillery team, and they were supposed to plot the position of their simulated targets. They had pre-planned targets. They had targets that they had to plot instantly and fire on immediately. They also had uh, targets that were forbidden targets, mm -hmm. cemeteries, churches, schools, uh, civilian housing. And when they were well rested, the observers would be call, calling in orders on where to fire. And they would deliberately call in things that were forbidden. Mm -hmm. And the artillery term had to recognize it as a forbidden target and not fire on it. Uh -huh. They also had to plot these other ones immediately or fire on the pre-planned ones. And when they were well rested, they did well. When they were sleep deprived, they found that they couldn't fire on the targets that had to be fired on immediately. And when they got called into a forbidden area, they couldn't tell if it was forbidden or not, and they fired on it regardless. Uh, and they had no idea, they had lost a sense of where their units were and where the enemy units were as well. And that was just with sleep deprivation. Um, and they found that even with flying an airplane, that sleep deprivation will decrease performance and you cannot compensate for it by more training. 
-hmm. In other words, even if you have a very experienced pilot, sleep deprivation will cause a decrease in performance, even if he's experienced. That's incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. And the military, they've also done other studies. Um, uh, they f and another study with uh, the military uh, artillery teams. Um, and in, in this study, uh, they looked at um, four artillery teams. One got seven hours of sleep a night. One got six hours of sleep a night. One got three hours of sleep a night. Oh, excuse me, four hours. It was seven, six, five, and four. And the first day, they counted how many shells they got on target that day. And the first team, getting seven hours of sleep, got 350 shells on target. That was pretty good. Second team got 360 shells on target. That was pretty good. The other team got 375, which is even better. And the fourth team got 400 shells. So instead of 350, when you got seven hours of sleep, if you shot for an extra three hours, it went from 350 up to 400 shells. So you think, well, okay, I can get more done if I just sleep four hours a night. Well, that was on day one. They then followed them for 21 days. At the end of 21 days, those getting seven hours of sleep a night were still getting 350 shells on target daily. But those getting four hours of sleep, it had dropped from 400 down to 60 shells on target. So instead of the 350, like the seven hour group, it had dropped to 60. That was 17% of what they could have been getting if they had been getting seven hours of sleep regularly. And the frightening part was when they asked these artillerymen, how well are you doing? They all said, we're doing great. They had no idea that their performance had decreased so dramatically um, and you know we can we can be the same situation where if we aren't getting the sleep we need we can be functioning at 50 percent capacity and think there's something wrong with us genetically or whatever and not realize that we're chronically sleep deprived and we just need more sleep to bring our performance up to where it, where it could be um, and it, it kind of relates to the idea that when we're sleep deprived, we can't set priorities, we can't do forethought, we can't pre-plan, we can't take initiative, we can't stay focused on the task at hand. Um, we're easily distracted. Um, we can, uh, what does it mean easily distract? I might have a stack of papers, you know, I gotta go through on my desk and I find myself stringing paper clips together. I mean, that, that's being distractible, and that happens more frequently when we're, when we're tired. You know, Dr. Emerson, the thought just occurred to me, one of the greatest temptations Christ had to face was that he was kept up all night. Mm. And he still had to function in a way that glorified his Father. Yes, and yes, it's true. He was, <clears throat> he was beaten a couple times and um, then he was kept up all night and yet even under that horrific lack of sleep he still glorified God the Father yes he did yeah it was um, and we wouldn't you know, voluntarily put ourselves in that condition but there are times where we may have to function under lack of sleep like, like he did. So he had the habit of taking time with his Heavenly Father every day, and I believe that enabled him to continue uh, what he did normally. Um, do you believe that if we take time with God, it will help us get the adequate rest that we need? Yes, I believe um, that uh, the Holy Spirit can influence us and speak to our hearts. Bible promises, you'll hear a word behind you saying, this is the way walking in it. That's the Holy Spirit talking to us and directing our lives. 
And if we're open to it and listening to it, he will direct our lives based on that, that promise. Um, however, uh, yeah. getting the sleep we need, I believe, can make us more open to those impressions. What do you think are some of the distractions that would pull us away from getting the rest we need at night? Um, that's a good question. The, uh, we find that our ancestors actually had 20% uh, more sleep than we have. Um, they, uh, they, if they got seven or eight hours of sleep a night, um, we're only getting maybe six and a half, that'd be, you know, 20% less. And um, part of the reason is because we have electricity. Um, when the sun went down in their days, they went to sleep. The sun rose, they got up. Um, they had a regular rhythm based on, on the, the uh, sun. Today, we have TV, we have iPhones, we have uh, lights, we have all kinds of temptations, things that want to keep us up. And we will be sleeping, they estimate, about one and a half hours less a night than uh, our ancestors did. Also, um, night shift workers, people that work at the night shift, uh, tend to get about one and a half hours less sleep than those that don't. Mm -hmm. In Ardmore, Oklahoma, our pulmonologist I knew, uh, he did the sleep studies. We had a tire plant in the city in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and they had a night shift. Mm -hmm. And the people would come in with all kinds of, of challenges, problems, because they worked the night shift. And he wrote to the tire company trying to get them to get rid of their night shift, but of course, they're not going to do that because that decreases their productivity mm. and, you know, to get rid of us, to have a building that's not being used eight hours a day, um, decreased, you know, profits. Uh, and so they get less sleep. And if you say, okay, one and a half hours of sleep, that doesn't sound like much. But if you go back to the artillery group, the one that was getting seven hours of sleep versus the one that was getting four hours of sleep. If you, uh, if you go from 350 to 60 shells a day, that's a seven, you're down to 17% productivity. That's missing three hours. If you go to half of that, it puts you to about 175 shells. That's about 50% productivity. Mm -hmm. So that artillery team, instead of 350 shells, if they were getting one and a half hours less sleep, they would be at 50% productivity, mm. which is a huge amount. And I, I, again, many of us are in chronic fatigue and don't realize it. Um, the artillery team, as we mentioned earlier, did not know that their function had decreased um, so dramatically. Mm. Uh, and that was one of the dangers, because if you don't realize there's a problem, you're not gonna go you know, try to find a solution. That's true. Um, these Episodes of chronic fatigue can result in major catastrophes. Mm -hmm. uh, on the early 80s, you had a, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, a big tanker, uh, yeah. lost its oil, it had this big oil slick, and it was due to chronic fatigue. The other uh, challenge is, is uh, microsleep. This is another consequence of lack of sleep. You can be driving and your eyes can be open and yet you can still be asleep mm. for a few seconds. And the thing that pulls you out of it is you hit those little bumps in the road and the center of the road and the side of the road and it kind of jars you awake. But that microsleep, of course, can result in accidents as well. And uh, I've even had friends who tell me that they're driving home and they don't remember half of the drive home. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's frightening. Uh, a classic example was during World War II. In World War II, uh, yeah. England was fighting for its life. Uh, Germany was sending over rockets and bombing London. Um, and England, the only thing it had to do to fight back, it had to build bombers to send them back, try to bomb the 
rocket installations. Um, and they were working 66 hours a week. Mm. That's like nine and a half hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that was yeah. burning them out. They had a lot of um, fatigue. Uh, the morale was down, a lot of spoiled workmanship, uh, a lot of absenteeism. They just mm. wouldn't show up. Um, and so they said, OK, despite the war effort, we're going to have to cut back from 66 hours a week to 48 hours a week. Mm. We're going to give them one day off a week, six eight-hour shifts a week. Mm. And it says, despite the war effort, we're going to have to do this. So they did that. And what happened was the a absenteeism dropped. People weren't absent. Morale improved. Errors in workmanship decreased, and they said, we're just going to have to accept producing fewer planes. But what they found was the exact opposite. Their productivity actually increased 15%. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a, you know, a surprise to them. Uh, and I remember in, in residency, uh, the thought was, well, we've got to, I've got to stay up late to study more, to pass boards, um, to get more done. But when I read this, I realized, no, if I actually want to accomplish more, I have to get my sleep. And if I get my sleep, I'll actually produce 15% more mm. than if I don't get my, get my sleep. And, uh, and that's, that was a take-home lesson from, uh, from, from the studies that I, I was doing on sleep. So some things can seem counterintuitive. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's a temptation to try to stay up. And one of the temptations to try to stay up is uh, let's use caffeine. Let's just mm. use caffeine to keep functioning. Uh, is caffeine the solution? Actually, they did another study. I heard this secondhand that uh, marksmen, when they were off caffeine uh, or when they were using caffeine, they could see a simulated sniper in a tree. They could aim the gun faster and they could pull the trigger faster, but their accuracy was way down. Mm. Um, caffeine, again, shuts off the frontal lobe function first, and you start responding by reflex rather than processing how to, how to handle something. Uh, the difference being, um, if you're first learning to tie your shoe, your frontal lobe is involved because you're having to figure it out. How do I do this? And you kind of trial and error, and you're learning. Once you learn how to tie your shoe, then you don't call on your frontal lobe anymore. You call on your reflexes, your memory. Mm. How did I do this yesterday or the day before? And you just repeat it. When you're on caffeine, again, you're running more on reflex. And that can get you by in a lot of situations if you've experienced those situations before. But if you have a new challenge you haven't seen before, you will need your frontal lobe to figure it out. And if you're mm. on caffeine or lack of sleep, it, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be there. Um, alcohol is like caffeine. Well, it's a altering mood alter, brain altering drug, but it's a suppressant. It's not a stimulant. And uh, with alcohol, you will have the same effect as lack of sleep in terms of driving performance, and it can affect you very similarly. Uh, so, I think well. What's the solution? <laughs> you know, if caffeine isn't the solution, uh, what's the solution? Um, actually, getting regular sleep, eight hours a night, is uh, is key. Uh, that's hard to do sometimes with uh, with our phones and with our uh, you know people being able to contact us at all hours. So. Um, one thing to do is to, you know, put your phone in, you know, airplane mode or just have the voicemail take your calls. Um, it's good to do something relaxing, wind down an hour or two before sleep. It's better to have a set time for sleep. And if you have a set time, your body will start to train itself to get sleepy at that time. Um, if you... Uh, 
uh, exercise, it's best to do it maybe earlier in the day so it doesn't keep you awake. Avoid things like caffeine especially, especially in the evening. Um, the hours before midnight are more twice as restful as the hours after midnight. Mm -hmm. So I say eight hours of sleep is, is ideal. If you go from midnight to eight o'clock though, there's no hours before midnight, that is not as restful as going from nine o'clock in the evening to five in the morning where you have eight hours of sleep, but you have three hours before midnight, you'll feel much more rested. Um, I know with uh, uh, even cardiovascular functioning is better. We have a, a VO2 machine. It's a, it measures your maximum oxygen consumption. It's the best measure of cardiovascular fitness that we have. And you can do it at rest, and you can do it with maximal exertion on a bicycle uh, ergometer. Um, on that, the instructions that come with the machine, it says be sure the person gets eight hours of sleep the night before or they will have a depressed VO2 max. Mm. They will not be able to put out the energy that they should if they get that sleep. And I found, uh, I tried an experiment getting to bed at nine o'clock for three nights in a row. And prior to that, I'd had trouble hitting high notes on the trumpet because it needs your embouchure and strengthen your embouchure. But when I got those three nights of rest, uh, all of a sudden the next day I was playing those high notes without difficulty. So um, it does make a, a major difference in terms of athletic performance, cardiovascular mm -hmm. fitness. Um, so that's regular sleep. Exercise, of course, improves your cardiovascular fitness, and it also helps get better rest and sleep. Now, Dr. Emerson, you were talking about some things that people could do to prepare themselves for sleep. Um, and like having the same time you go to bed every night. Um, so for older people, um, they, we recommend they drink their fluids earlier in the afternoon. Uh, versus right before going to bed because often they will wake up in the middle of the night and need to empty their bladders. But if they get their fluids earlier in the afternoon, then they can empty their bladders before they go to sleep and that will allow them to sleep more restfully and not necessarily wake up in the middle of the night. Um, some other things that can help uh, for someone wanting to get a, a good um, bedtime routine is doing this things in the same order, such as brushing your teeth, um, taking your shower, um, ha dimming the lights, uh, um, having some time with God. All of these things can prepare the mind and the body to be in a restful situation. Dr. Emerson mentioned the blue, uh, our iPhones, these little, uh, machines right here, um, computers and small packages. The blue light on those will actually cause a person to stay awake. And we recommend getting a blue light screen where it filters out the blue light. But even better than that would be to turn off the ringer or put it in airplane mode or leave it in another room. I've had people tell me, but what about if my kids are in a bad accident or something? Well, we've chosen to keep a landline in our house, and we don't give that number out. We always give our cell phone numbers out. But what I've come to realize is our kids know our landline number, and they can call us in case of an emergency on the landline. Where, uh, and that will keep me personally off my iPhone um, and have a far less temptation to check emails, um, to check the news at night. Um, probably it's best to check the news during the day. Then our minds won't be troubled by things that we see and read. Dr. Emerson, did you have any other suggestions along those lines? Yeah, um, actually another kind of rest, not actually sleep rest, is recreation rest. Uh, yeah. When you take a vacation, it's important to get real rest. Uh, not like, say, the Japanese. When we were in Guam, 
Guam was like Hawaii to the Japanese. Okay. They would come there from their cold climate to Guam's warm tropical climate. And, but they were type A personalities. They would go, go, go. They would be parasailing, water skiing, scuba diving, snorkeling, shopping, dining. And I knew that at the end of their week vacation, when they went to Japan, they would need another week to recover from their vacation. Uh, Winston Churchill is quoted during, in 1941, during World War II, he said, if we are to win this war, it will be by staying power. Mm -hmm. For this reason, we must have one holiday per week and one week holiday per year. And it's similar to the biblical injunction of um, uh, not working on the seventh day of the week uh, and having that as a rest day. Um, and the Jewish uh, calendar had three one or two week holidays where they would come to Jerusalem for the holiday and they would get that rest and that break. Um, recently talked to a dentist who uh, incorporated that program into his life and all of a sudden his productivity uh, increased uh, dramatically. Um, eating and drinking healthily, a, a vegan diet with lots of water earlier in the day helps the body work more efficiently and rest better. Uh, avoid nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol. This will give you better sleep. If you are on caffeine and nicotine and you stop that, you will actually feel more exhausted, usually for a day or two, while your body catches up on its sleep. But after that, your energy level should actually be superior to what it was when you were on uh, the caffeine. Uh, caffeine withdrawal or nicotine withdrawal, uh, can cause symptoms. Um, when you take caffeine or nicotine, it causes vasoconstriction. When you come off of it, there's vasodilation, which is not a problem in your muscles or your legs or arms because the muscles can expand. But if it happens in your head, you've got a closed cavity skull, you get this pounding headache. And the people that make aspirin add caffeine to the aspirin because they realize that many, if not most, the headaches they're treating are not are caffeine or nicotine withdrawal. So when you take the aspirin with the caffeine, it causes vasoconstriction, gets rid of the headache. But when you come off that caffeine, you're going to get your headache back again. And so it's best to uh, stop those cold turkey if you want to get rid of the headache. Ice to the forehead can cause vasoconstriction. A hot foot bath can help pull blood away from the brain and help decrease this, get rid of that pounding headache if you're coming to withdrawal. Um, um, symptoms. Um, and there's more reasons than that to stay off of the caffeine. When I was younger, I was actually taught not to drink caffeine, but as I worked a 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. 12-hour shift in the ICU um, at Vanderbilt Hospital, I started drinking caffeine to help me wake up. Um, it actually got so bad that I would panic if I didn't have a two liter bottle in the refrigerator. Um, but I have consequences because of that. When I came off of the caffeine, I actually had ringing in my ears and lost part of my hearing from drinking so much of it. So there's more side effects than just the sleep deprivation. Yeah, yeah. Caffeine, again, can, and nicotine can shut down the frontal lobe. So if somebody offends you, you're running on reflexes again, you want to punch them out. But if your frontal lobe is working, when, you're, when you've had your sleep and you're off the caffeine and nicotine, you can say, maybe there's a better way to handle this. <laughs> and you can start working through it, and it can preserve relationships. So in the choices you're making, you need to set priorities. Um, and having good relationships in your family is, should be a top priority mm -hmm. and avoiding caffeine and nicotine where you're running on reflexes and just reacting to offenses rather than bearing patiently with them. Um, that is an important priority. Uh, I heard a little story about a little girl who's she was riding in her car with her daddy, and she says, Daddy, where do all the bad drivers go when mom's driving? <laughs> okay, because, of course, he was reacting to all irritations, where mom had the same irritations but wasn't reacting. 
And if you are someone prone to reacting, getting your sleep and coming off of nicotine and caffeine can go a long ways in allowing you to respond in a way that at the end of the day, you say, yeah, I'm glad I responded that way. The uh, Bible says a soft word turns away wrath. And uh, so I think that's what, what God, how God wants us to respond to offenses, and the sleep will help you do that. Um, so preserving relationships is one priority. Another priority, of course, is good work performance. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, many of us have trouble functioning at home or at work, and we think there must be just something wrong with me. Um, and, uh, and they don't realize that it could be chronic sleep deprivation. Oh, if uh, one key uh, to getting good sleep, uh, as we get older, our ability to produce melatonin seems to decrease. Mm -hmm. And uh, many older people will sleep four or five hours and then all of a sudden wake up and can't get back to sleep. Um, if they take melatonin, the rapid acting kind, it typically lasts maybe four or five hours and then it stops working and then you wake up. If you're using melatonin to help sleep, because melatonin is our normal hormone, neurotransmitter in the brain, which helps us sleep. If you're using melatonin, get the extended release melatonin because that lasts for the whole eight hours. Uh, you may have to titrate your dose to get the proper dose for good sleep because it, it uh, um, if you take too much, you can feel groggy the next morning. Um, and of course, if you take too little, it won't have a good effect. Some people, half a milligram is all they need and others can be up to 10 milligrams. Uh, but uh, the extended release is the kind to look for to help uh, uh, get you through the whole, the whole night. So um, those are some tips for getting good sleep. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, set a schedule. Um, try to get the same bedtime each night. Uh, get your hours before midnight in. It will make you much more rested the next day. Exercise 30 minutes or 40 minutes three times a week will actually improve the ability to sleep. Um, getting recreation. When you take a vacation, make sure it's a true vacation where you're restful and able to prepare for returning to work when the vacation's over. Uh, a vegan food and lots of water can help your system function better. Um, avoid alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine. Uh, these will play havoc with your sleep-wake cycle. Uh, and make it difficult at night to, uh, to get to sleep if you're using caffeine and nicotine. Um, by the way, uh, one indication of nicotine or caffeine addiction is when you wake up the next morning with this vasodilation, if you wake up with a headache, um, that's a tip off that you're going through withdrawal and people usually need the first cigarette or caffeine or coffee to get rid of the headache because they're going through withdrawal when they sleep at night. That would be a time to, uh, you know, stop the caffeine, stop the nicotine, drink plenty of water, and um, if you get a craving for caffeine, they only usually last two minutes, you know, drink some water for two minutes and the craving will usually go away. And then uh, preserve relationships and work performance uh, realize that your family relationships will be dependent on you getting enough sleep and your work performance will also be dependent on getting uh, more adequate sleep. Well, thank you, Dr. Emerson. Those are excellent tips on getting our rest. And we're so glad you all joined us this evening for this podcast on sleep.